Thank you very much. Um, so I have the uh, sort of unenviable task of trying to bring together all the strands of the, the presentations that you've had this morning uh, to try and uh, give you a picture about what all these global developments really mean for the outlook for trade and the overall balance of risks um, that we see both within and, and between the emerging markets and advanced economies. So I'll try and take you through that, but ensure that we have uh, enough time for uh, a panel discussion uh, ahead of our, our lunch. Um, and I should also say that some of my slides uh, will be slightly different from what, uh, what are in your uh, printout, just to try and uh, bring in uh, some more of those sort of uh, global risks. Uh, but I do know that Tony and his colleagues will make those slides uh, available uh, to you, uh, should you want those. So I think, uh, I always think it's sort of helpful to, to just look at a bit from a sort of longer term perspective, but also to, to think ahead. So I think overall, the, the, on the outset, the sort of picture in, in emerging markets. So, I mean, obviously, we are expecting to see a, a, the sort of global recovery in, in some sense is in train. And I, I think you'll have seen from the presentations this morning that that recovery is perhaps more established uh, in the US at the moment uh, than it is in Europe. Um, but I think generally uh, emerging markets have outgrown the uh, growth in, in the advanced economies. Uh, but I think we're now at a situation where I think some of the economic risks in emerging markets are really uh, coming to a bit of a, a crunch time. Uh, and I think we've seen that reflected in some of the volatility uh, in financial markets. Um, so what I'd like to do is to sort of unpick uh, some of those risks um, and also look at uh, the sort of overall picture in the advanced economies as well. So I think what we've seen since the start of the year uh, is that the world trade and investment cycle is, a, is much more subdued than maybe we were expecting six months ago. And I think a lot of the reasons behind that is that we are seeing a bit of a stalling in domestic demand in, in some of the emerging markets. And I'm sure uh, Yves took you through some of the, the reasons why there's more concerns over growth in China, um, which is fed through to slower trade growth uh, throughout the rest of Asia. But I think you can also look at the sort of investment orders uh, that we're getting from the US and, and Japan, which also shows that investment is a bit more subdued. And I think what we're actually seeing is that some of the sort of main drivers of growth in emerging markets are starting to not have some of the kick that they once had. Um, so this overall growth in portfolio flows, which has helped to drive down interest rates in emerging markets, just doesn't seem to be translating into the overall growth in domestic demand and investment that we might have expected. And China's a very good illustration of that, um, where we've seen vast growth in, in credit uh, but more recently, that just hasn't translated into the high investment rates that China's enjoyed over the past 10 years. And part of that is a, a specific policy choice to try and rebalance the economy in China towards higher consumption. But it also does reflect overinvestment in certain sectors and the fact that policy is becoming slightly less effective. And I think we can see that theme uh, carried out through some of the other emerging markets. And I would say the other sort of main engine of growth in emerging markets, this rising middle class and the opening up of trade opportunities both within emerging markets, uh, but also from the emerging markets uh, to the advanced economies. Uh, really, a lot of that engine is predicated on some crucial structural reforms and political stability in some of the emerging markets. And I think investors generally are getting a bit more nervous about some of the progress that we've seen on those reforms. So I think there really are um, some serious risks in terms of how uh, things could sort of go on and go wrong rather, and how some of that global recovery that we expect to see may not come to pass. And so uh, sometimes we find it useful to just sort of think about it in terms of a sort of overall <coughs> risk matrix. So you can think of here as the, the sort of baseline scenario where I think this is what uh, most economists would say that we, we do expect emerging markets to recover, for world trade to pick up, um, 
The US recovery is more uh, grounded now. Um, and even in Europe, uh, while the delever deleveraging is sort of constraining the overall recovery in Europe, particularly with all the fiscal austerity, we are expecting to see a recovery in Europe over the course of the next year or two. But I think where things can go wrong is uh, just this sort of uh, issue about the weak transmission of some of the monetary policy stimulus in emerging markets and some of the structural impediments in the major uh, emerging markets. And that really could have significant implications for global trade. And I think if we think about Europe, in some sense, uh, the issues there really do all stem around the, the politics. I think in, our, in the sort of baseline case, uh, there's enough political buy-in, I think, to the Eurozone that we don't think it's most likely that we'll see a breakup of the Euro Eurozone. Um, but there clearly is a, a risk that that political buy-in starts to crumble, particularly if high unemployment uh, continues or increases even further. Some of that fiscal austerity could really... Um, become unbearable, and we'll see an increase in the sort of pro-exit parties gaining popularity, and no real progress on the sort of banking and, and fiscal union. And I think the other sort of risk uh, that we would also highlight, which relates to this issue about portfolio flows, is we're in a, a sort of crucial point in terms of uh, the decisions by policymakers in the US, uh, in the euro area, and in Japan, uh, in terms of, uh, certainly in the case of the US, about when that quantitative easing starts to be withdrawn. And we can already see in the events of the past uh, week or so just how jittery markets are in terms of the responses to what uh, people at the Fed are saying. And they're really watching very closely to see what, what will happen in terms of the withdrawal of some of the quantitative easing. And I think the uh, probability of, of some sort of mistakes by policymakers, perhaps overreacting to higher inflation, really could have global implications. And so you can sort of map those risk scenarios, if you like, just to uh, give you just sort of some sense of, of the overall scale. So if we start from our baseline. Uh, if we saw a sort of uh, a kind of coordinated uh, issues across emerging markets that could significantly lower growth. Though I think, uh, obviously, if the Eurozone were to break up, uh, that would have more uh, damaging implications for overall world growth. Um, whereas if we see some, some mistakes by the major central banks, that will not only uh, impact on uh, GDP growth, but in that scenario, we're likely to get more inflation uh, relative to what we might see at the moment. So I think just, just looking a bit, trying to uh, draw across the major economies, looking at the overall increase in uh, quantitative easing across the advanced economies. Uh, so this just shows the overall increase in the, the balance sheets. And uh, this story is probably familiar to you with uh, the Bank of England being uh, very active um, and the Fed as well, whereas the, uh, the Bank of Japan, as I'll come on to show, is only really now starting to get going. Uh, and the Eurozone has been more cautious. But all that sort of liquidity into the financial system has really helped to drive down the cost of borrowing across emerging markets. And that's not only provided some fuel to domestic demand, uh, consumption, and investment in the major emerging markets, but it's also given uh, governments a lot more fiscal space through having lower debt payments and a lot more ability to spend on the necessary infrastructure. But I think it's crucially also added to the risks from rising property prices. And I'm sure uh, this sort of chart is familiar to a lot of you, the very strong rises we've seen in, in property prices across some of the major Asian markets. And last week, I, I was at the um, World Economic Forum in, in Myanmar. And uh, just to give another illustration of how uh, when you get a massive inflow of investment into an economy as it opens up. Uh, it was, we were quite shocked going on a, a tour of, of some of the uh, major uh, properties in Yangon that uh, a two-bedroom apartment in Yangon, we were told, were going for prices of about a million dollars US. 
which when you see the level of infrastructure uh, in Yangon was really quite amazing. Um, and I think partly reflects that the situation where you have a cash-based economy uh, and you start opening up to all this investment, but it's chasing very few properties that are actually on the market. And it's also put a lot of pressure on exchange rates um, and the volatility of exchange rates, which is obviously crucial to the sort of prospects for trade. And I think you can make some sort of good contrast between the developments in, say, Brazil and India um, from this. So the, the sort of major story on, on Brazil over the past couple of years is the real, the appreciation of its currency uh, has really put its manufacturing sector under pressure, and it's really struggling uh, to compete. So in some sense, the recent uh, sharp depreciation of currencies um, across emerging markets for Brazil is potentially good news and could act as a bit of a, a safety valve uh, as long as it doesn't happen too quickly. But I think if you contrast that situation with India, uh, there we have a country where inflation has been a lot more sticky and persistent, and so the depreciation depreciation there could have a much larger impact on inflation and limit the ability of the Reserve Bank of India to respond. But despite that sort of, uh, I think, the, the major issues and risks that we see in terms of the withdrawal of quantitative easing and how that might impact uh, financial markets across the globe, I think it's important to, to always just remember why uh, people do think that emerging markets will continue to grow strongly over the next few years. Um, and so this just shows uh, our projections for households with an income greater than $30,000 US. So particularly uh, in these countries, that's when you would uh, start to have a significant amount of disposable income. And obviously it prevents, uh, provides uh, you know, good opportunities for businesses, particularly in, term, in terms of uh, consumer products. And you really get a sense of the phenomenal rise where in China, a couple of years ago, the number of households with this income level was just around one or two million. Um, but by 2020, that's likely to increase to over 30 million. And I think that phenomenal rise in the middle class will drive the development of consumption in Asia. And it's one of the reasons why uh, Asia will become a bit more of a self-sufficient trading hub um, because a lot of the sort of final demand um, will be uh, within Asia. So, for instance, uh, we expect over the next 10 years the fastest growing trade routes to be between China and India and India and China uh, as we see more of the final domestic demand within emerging markets. And I think another sort of uh, pattern underpinning some of the developments tr in trade has been what we've seen in terms of the, the rising uh, wages and that's a sort of shifting competitiveness. Um, and I, I know this is a bit of a spaghetti chart. Um, but uh, I think the, the point to draw out is really just that wages in China have been really uh, growing spectacularly fast, which reflects the fact that China has been moving up the value-added chain and um, enjoying higher labor productivity. Uh, but it is also the reason why uh, sectors like the textile industry are now increasingly moving to countries like Bangladesh or Vietnam, uh, where wages are a lot lower. And you can also see here one of the issues between contrasting the rise of wages we've seen in Brazil and its relatively weak competitiveness uh, relative to Mexico, which has kept wages relatively low. And it's also another reason why the recovery in the US um, is set in train. Uh, because actually the manufacturing sector in the US um, <clears throat> is at now one of its most sort of competitive levels. Um, and so that rise in can, uh, wages in, in Brazil has been one of the reasons why the sort of manufacturing sector uh, really hasn't grown at all over the past couple of years. And so that uh, sort of underpins how uh, Brazil will need to diversify its economy um, and hope to grow the higher value-added manufacturing as well as the service sector uh, when it can't always rely on oil and uh, commodities. Um, but if you contrast that with Mexico, which has managed to stay much more competitive, you can see how uh, car vehicle production um, 
has really increased in, in Mexico, and it's becoming quite a good um, uh, base for higher-end manufacturing. And that also provides a, a sort of two-way support with the US, uh, which can kind of um, tap on its, its sort of strong trade links with Mexico. So I think to, to sort of summarize some of the, the overall risks in, in emerging markets, I think we are expecting to see more of that trade shifting between uh, emerging markets. But I think one of the, the major risks that we see uh, is the rise of, of protectionism. And I think particularly in tough economic times, that is always a risk. Uh, and I think I'm sure most of you are f familiar with the uh, tariffs that the European Commission has recently put on solar panels uh, and Beijing's response. And of course, there's always a risk that that could move into other sectors or sort of escalate. And I think it also sort of underlines the tensions, the political tensions within the Eurozone, where you've seen Germany has managed to be successful uh, relatively in the Eurozone because, of, because it's been able to tap into the strong growth in emerging markets and really uh, present itself as a, a manufacturing base uh, to export to emerging markets. And so it's quite keen to kind of keep those trade links strong. Um, but some of the other countries within Europe, like France, that are starting to struggle with their overall competitiveness are increasingly arguing for more protectionism. And I think on the, uh, obviously in the developments in Turkey um, ju has just sort of shown how the sort of nervousness in, in some emerging markets in terms of uh, the overall political risk um, and how some fairly innocuous uh, demonstrations can uh, start to change the whole sort of uh, political outlook in a country. And particularly, as I'm sure Yves took you through, earlier, so particularly when some of the economic fundamentals uh, in Turkey are looking a lot riskier, um, that really has a chance to sort of spiral. Um, so I, I mean, this slide is just taking you through some of the mechanisms where you might see uh, kind of a coordinated slowdown across emerging markets and the overall impact on world growth. But I think it's probably useful just to sort of highlight what we see as the sort of crucial reforms that might happen uh, in the BRICS and, and where we think those may not happen. Uh, I don't want to go through all of them, but I suppose I would uh, sort of highlight that in China over the next five to 10 years, um, in order to increase the overall level of consumption, it nearly really needs to reform the financial sector. Uh, it needs to deal with a very high level of urbanization uh, and that will uh, create the need for a lot of uh, policy changes, but I think it, there are major risks and pressure points from rising corruption, environmental pressures, and inequality. And I think uh, in India, it really needs to attract some uh, more foreign direct investment. And uh, what we're seeing at the moment, it's a difficult time for India because with provincial elections, uh, the sort of... Uh, the, the relative bargaining power of, of interest groups is, is quite high. Uh, and I think uh, finally on Russia has very ambitious plans to try and increase the, um, the sort of business environment. And amazingly, uh, Putin has said he wants to bring them from, I think their rank at the moment in the World Bank's ease of doing business is about 112. And he <laughs> wants to bring them into the, the top 20. Uh, which is really quite impressive, but obviously will take a lot of uh, reforms. And whether there is that political will, particularly if growth in Russia starts to stumble, uh, I would raise some, some question marks. Um, I just want to uh, very briefly just sort of tie back to some of the advanced economies. And just going back to what I was saying <laughs> earlier about uh, the withdrawal of, of quantitative easing, Obviously, what we're seeing in Japan at the moment is they are the country who are really trying a rather bold experiment to increase their quantitative easing, to try and raise inflation expectations to get consumption and to get consumer spending now rather than later, and to try and get businesses to use some of their very large um, corporate surplus rather uh, to spend on investment and really kickstart the economy. Um, but I think there's a real risk that the government there may, may start to give up before the policy has had time 
uh, to work. And I think it does highlight this issue that um, as we have the sort of withdrawal of QE, it has potential to impact both on the advanced economies, uh, but also some of the emerging markets. And I, I think on you know, the overall view on, on the US, uh, I think the recovery there really is in train. Um, and probably the situation there is a lot riskier, a lot less risky rather, <laughs> um, than it was a year ago. And a lot of that relates to the fact that they've just bought themselves more time in terms of the budget deadlock. Um, so uh, because the fiscal uh, position has come out better than they were expecting, they now have at least uh, until October before they need to re really reach a compromise on the medium term fiscal plan. Um, and, but partly as a result, what you're seeing is the Republicans and Democrats are becoming more entrenched uh, in, their, in their positions. So obviously the, the, the critical point in terms of uh, the withdrawal of, of QE is we don't want to see a sort of repeat of a sharp increase in, in bond yields um, that we saw in, in 1994. Um, but I, I mean, I, th I think uh, that's, that's more of a risk than what we will actually expect to see because I think some of the communication strategy by the Fed is a lot better. Um, but I think the volatility we've seen in financial markets in recent uh, days does is cast some doubt on that. Um, and finally, just uh, tur turning to the, the Eurozone, as I said before, we think there really is a clear political desire to maintain the Eurozone. But you only need to look at uh, the events in Cyprus to just see how it easy it is for policymakers uh, to get it wrong. Um, and in terms of overall growth in the Eurozone, Obviously, the, the moves to create further banking and fiscal union is crucial. And I think partly because of the, what we've seen in terms of Europe and obviously the, the need uh, for much greater fiscal austerity, uh, unsurprisingly, that we, that's led to uh, tax rises across the board. And this is just showing how, how much sort of VAT has increased uh, in different countries across Europe uh, since 2008. But I think in terms of the pressures on corporations, one of the things that that has done uh, is put more pressure on uh, the corp corporate tax bill, or certainly, um, uh, certainly more public pressure. And I think as corporate tax rates generally have come down over time, uh, VAT has had to rise to, to obviously to offset some of that. Uh, but now that we see real household disposable incomes in many of the advanced economies under pressure, we're seeing a bit of a public backlash uh, against some of the, uh, the tax structures uh, on corporations. And, um, and so that's adding another dimension in terms of uh, business risk for different uh, companies just trying to know what their tax liabilities or their effective tax liabilities really are. So I know that's been a bit of a sort of whirlwind tour across <laughs> both the emerging markets and, and the advanced economies, but hopefully I've managed to sort of draw together um, some of the themes from the other presentations that you've had this morning and just try to sort of highlight some of the, the risks and opportunities uh, for trade uh, at a global level. Uh, and I really look forward to discussing some of those issues further, both with, with all of you and, and some of my uh, fellow panel members. <laughs>